We're continuing our series on the parables of Christ, the parables of Christ. I'm going to move this back just a moment so that I don't trip over it because that would make a really, well, you could put that, I'm sure that'll be the most viewed video we have here on Rose Park, at least in the recent ones. Matthew chapter 24, but we'll continue our study on the parables of Christ. We're in Matthew chapter 24. We're going to read verses 44 through verse 51, then we're going to introduce this parable and uh, find about the parable of the faithful servant. Let me ask you, everybody, everybody look up here. How many of you want Jesus to find you faithful when he comes back? Did you raise your hand? Then this Bible study is for you. In fact, I don't think you'd be here on a Wednesday night, on a Wednesday, beautiful Wednesday night, I don't think you'd be in the house of God if you didn't want Jesus to be well pleased with your life. So this Bible passage is for you. Notice with me, Jesus speaking here. He says, therefore, be ye also ready. For in such an hour as ye think not, the Son of Man cometh. Who's that? That's Jesus. Now notice, he gives an explanation here of that uh, that statement. Who then is a, what's the next word there, church? It is a faithful. And what's that next word? wise servant, whom his Lord hath made ruler over his household, to give them meat in due season. Blessed is that servant, whom his Lord, when he cometh, shall find so doing. Verily I say unto you, that he shall make him ruler over all his goods. Now everybody look up here. How many of you think that would be a great thing right there? Jesus gives you a promotion. Amen. Verse 48. But, and if that evil servant shall say in his heart, My de Lord delayeth his coming, and shall begin to smite his fellow servants, and eat and drink with the drunken, the Lord of that servant shall come. My friend, listen, whether you're looking for him or not, Jesus is coming back. The Lord of that servant shall come in a day when he looketh not for him, and an hour that he is not aware of, and he shall cut him asunder. And appoint him his portion with the hypocrites. And there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. One more question. How many of you guys think that would be a very, very bad thing to have Jesus come back and find you slacking at your position and to remove you from your position? How many of you guys think that would be a bad thing? I don't want that to happen to me. My friend, the Bible teaching that Jesus gives is so very applicable to our lives. Let's pray. Father, we thank you, Lord, for this passage. We thank you, Lord, that you taught it for us and you taught it to us. And Father, I pray tonight, Lord, as we examine this parable of purpose, Lord, that you would help us. God, I pray, dear Lord, that this uh, parable would, would challenge us. And God, I pray, dear Lord, by, uh, Lord uh, by your grace, it would change us. And Father, we thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name, and amen. And I've said many, many times, the understanding, the context is so key. So hold your place here in Matthew 24, uh, in verse 44. Go back up with me to Matthew chapter 24 and verse 1. Notice with me in verse 1, let's find out where Jesus is, what Jesus is doing, who Jesus is talking to, and what is going on in, in this passage here. In Matthew chapter 24 and verse 1, and Jesus went out. And departed from the temple, and his disciples came to him for to show him the buildings of the temple. And Jesus said unto them, See ye not all these things? Verily I say unto you, there shall not be left here one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. Now notice here, and as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately saying, Tell us. When shall these things be, and what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? You see the question there? That's the setting for this parable. Now in verse 4, and Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you. Now we'll pause. We're going to stop our reading there because that gives us the context. It helps us to understand where we are, what's going on, who's talking, who's who's talking to who. Well, number one, notice here in your notes here, uh, that uh, the parable of the faithful servant is found in the final teaching ministry of Jesus. We're here on the, in Matthew chapter 24. Uh, the next thing you want to write down, they were at the Temple Mount. Two words, the Temple Mount. Jesus had been in the temple. 
He had been, uh, we have uh, looked at that during his, uh, the run-up to uh, what we call uh, Easter or his Passion Week where he was d- betrayed and crucified. He gave his last ministry in there in the temple. And then he comes and he's meeting with his disciples and they're just, they're like tourists, all right? They're looking at the temple. you got to remember, these guys weren't from Jerusalem. These guys were from Galilee. They had traveled the 70 miles down from Galilee in the north to Jerusalem, kind of in the middle of the country, Uh, and it was not normal for them. They might have come there once a year. They might have come there for the Passover and some of the different feasts, but it was not the, the opportunity that they had very often to just sit there, not surrounded by great crowds of pilgrims at that time, and to just look at the splendor of this temple. And so they were awed with the magnificence of it. And so they were at the Temple Mount. Now from the Temple Mount, you go down in the Valley of Kidron and then you come back up the other side and you're on the Mount of Olives. All right? From the Mount of Olives, you have an unobstructed view of the temple. In fact, when the Bible teaches us when Jesus and he comes back, his feet is a, he left from the Mount of Olives. He's going to come back and touch down on the Mount of Olives and, and directly in front of him and to the west is looking at the Temple Mount. That's what Jesus saw when he ascended. That's what Jesus will be looking at when he comes back. And so the disciples are gathered around and they're looking across the Kidron Valley and they're looking at the Temple Mount. They're looking at the temple and all its splendor. They're looking at all those that are over there worshiping and, and serving God. And so that's the setting for this parable now the question was this Jesus when is this all going to wrap up Jesus when are you coming back Jesus when are you going to set up your kingdom and that's when Jesus begins to give this teaching in Matthew chapter 24 he gives several uh, uh, sections of teaching in fact if you'll notice here in the in your the end of that paragraph here this parable the parable of the faithful servant is one of several final parables including that of the parable of the fig tree which is very short the parable of the ten virgins, which is one of the next parables we're going to study. And the, that of the talents. Uh, we say, what's a talent? A talent was a, a, a golden coin. It, it was a measure of money. We would call it a hundred dollar bill. But it was a currency in Israel. And, uh, and it was a whole different parable. And so this parable, the parable of the faithful servant is the one that kicks off the final teachings of Jesus' public ministry. Now, notice in your notes here, let's look at the people of this parable. Let's break this parable down. The first person you want to write down is the faithful servant. Notice back with me in Matthew chapter 24. Look with me in verse 45. This is the faithful servant. Who then is that faithful and wise servant whom his Lord hath made ruler over his household to give them their meat in that due, in the due season. Blessed is that servant whom his Lord, when he cometh, shall find so doing. Verily I say unto you that he shall make him ruler over all his goods. So, so the first person that we meet in the people of the parable is the faithful servant. This servant was, first of all, we notice he was knowledgeable in that he knew and understood his assigned responsibility. The servant, you say, how do I become a faithful servant? Well, the first thing that you and I need to do is be like this man here and find out what does Jesus want me to do, all right? This was a knowledgeable servant. He had a clear understanding of what God's expectations were. You say, pastor, how do I find out what Jesus wants me to do? That's why he gave you the Bible. Everybody take your Bible and hold your Bible up. Hold your Bible up. Hope you brought your Bibles to Midweek Bible Study right here. That's how you find out what Jesus wants you to do. Number two, you come, not only you go to the Word of God, and I don't have this in your notes here, but you come to the house of God where we preach and teach on the Word of God. Amen? And number three, you develop a personal relationship with the Spirit of God who's inside of you. And listen, so as you read the Word of God, the Spirit of God gives you discernment and gives you leading. You see, this is how it works. The general will of God, the, everything you need to know about the general will of God is in the Bible. The specific will of God is found in the leading of the Spirit in your life. Nowhere in the Bible will you find the name of the person you're supposed to marry. 
Nowhere in the Bible will you find the name of the company you're supposed to work for. Nowhere in the Bible will you find the specific direction of what house you're supposed to buy or, or, or what direction you're supposed to take. We find the general will of God in the Bible. But listen, as we get in the Bible, we learn the general will of God. We're living and walking with God. And then we have a relationship with the Spirit of God. And we, we're, we're tuning our ears to His leading. Then He leads us into the specific will of God. So this servant, back to our parable, he was knowledgeable. He knew and understood his assigned responsibility in his Lord's kingdom. Now, number two, this servant was also wise. Next thing you want to write down there is wise. He was a very wise servant. My friends, listen, you can't become wise until you become knowledgeable. Until you figure out what God wants you to do, you can't master what God wants you to do. You can't fulfill God's will for your life. But this man knew his role. He understood it. And then he was wise in that he in faithfully performing his duty. Now, how long did he do that? He did that for a prolonged period of time. And it is interesting, he did that without supervision or incentive even in the long absence of his Lord. See, what happened was this in this parable, and we're going to find this out, it's, it's developed a little bit more in the upcoming parables. The king has uh, established his kingdom, and the king has people, servants in his kingdom, and the king has given his servants in the kingdom a job to do. Let me ask you this here. Let me let, me let you know this. Uh, who's the king? Let's say his name together. It's Jesus, all right? Now, Jesus is the king. We all know that. We are his servants. We are his servants. Now, it's important, number one, if we're going to become a faithful servant, to figure out what does Jesus want us to do. Number two, we are very wise to do it. Now, when Jesus says someone wise, wise, my friend, they're a wise person. Now, he was wise because this servant understood that his Lord was telling them the truth. The, 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 the king came and said, I want you to do this, and 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 I'm going away, and I'm coming back. We're going to get into this a little bit more later, but listen, the servant was wise. He knew what he was supposed to do. He knew that there would be an accountability coming someday, and he was very wise to order his life in accordance with those two truths. The king gave him something to do. The king is going to come back and hold me accountable. I am going to make my decisions, my choices in this life based on those two truths. Jesus said that is a very wise servant. And by the way, he was also wise in the fact that, listen, there was no supervisor over top of him. There was no weekly incentive. There was no monthly incentive. We do not know how long the king was going to be gone. He didn't know. He just knew, listen, my king is coming back. I want to make my king happy. He didn't have to have somebody looking over his shoulder. Read this today. If your pastor has to tell you to come to church, obviously church isn't that important to you. That's true. Uh, listen, my friend, one of the greatest days in your Christian life is when you stop doing what you're doing for Jesus because somebody is watching over you other than Jesus. My friend, if you only read your Bible, if you only pray, if you only serve God because somebody that you either love or fear is making you do it, my friend, you do not have a strong relationship with the Lord. Now, that's a strong statement, but I'll stand behind it. Jesus said this was a wise servant. His master was gone, but he was faithful in his duties. Now, number two, number two, where the second person in the parable we're introduced here is the master, is the master. So the next thing you want to write down is this is the master. This is the Lord. This is the Lord who has given two things. Number one, the Lord has given rolls. Rolls, not dinner rolls. We all love dinner rolls with butter, but this isn't that kind of roll, okay? This is a, a rolls and responsibilities. Rolls would be an office, a title, a, a description, but a responsibility is to everybody. Now listen, my friend, I hope that you've learned this by now in your uh, attendance to the reading of the Word of God and your participation in the house of God. But listen, doesn't matter if you have a title or if you don't have a title, Jesus has a job for you. Jesus has a responsibility for you. 
I've said this often, but I'll say it again. It bears repeating. God describes the, the church, his organization, his body. Listen, not only as his bride, but he describes it as his body. And a body needs every part. Listen, I never really thought much about my right knee until Monday, all right? Till late Sunday afternoon when my knee was throbbing, all right? I never knew that, listen, you need both your knees to stand up out of a chair, all right? You need both your knees, uh, listen, just to roll over. You need both your knees to do a lot of different things. And when one of them is not cooperating, one of them is not participating, my friend, it makes life difficult. And God's will and God's plan and God's purpose, listen, He's given each of you. He may have not given you a title, but He has given all of us a responsibility. All of us have something to do in the kingdom of our Lord. Now, that's the second person in the people of the parable. Let's read on here. Let's find the third one. This is the unfaithful servant. This is the unfaithful servant. Drop your reading down and now notice with me, if you will, look at verse 48. In verse 48, but, and if that evil servant, so this is a different servant, same master, same kingdom, same king, same responsibility, but if that evil servant shall say in his heart, my Lord delayeth his coming and shall begin to smite his fellow servants, mistreating other Christians, and eat and drink with the drunken, misbehaving in life. Notice here, the Lord of that servant shall come in a day when he looketh not for him, in an hour that he is not aware of, and shall cut him asunder, and appoint him his portion with the hypocrites. We're going to find out who those are in a minute. And there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Now let's look at this. The third person we find out about that we meet in this parable is the un faithful servant. This servant grew two things. This servant, first of all, he grew careless. Careless. That didn't mean he dropped the china. That didn't mean that he, he just, uh, he didn't care. Listen, what that meant was he lost focus on his earnest desire and responsibility. He grew to live without care. He grew to live without passion. He grew to live without love and loyalty. He didn't care anymore who his master was. He didn't care anymore what his responsibility was. He grew careless. Number two, and when we grow careless, when we stop caring about what Jesus wants and what Jesus has given me to do, then we grow reckless. Reckless. This unfaithful servant grew, first of all, careless. And number two, he grew reckless. He began to mistreat one another. You know when Christians mistreat other, one another, you know what Jesus calls that? He calls that a wicked servant. You mark that down, my friend. Jesus cares what you, how you talk about other Christians. Jesus cares about what you think about other Christians. Jesus cares about what you post and tweet and pin about other Christians. Amen? Jesus is paying attention and then number two, not only did he grow reckless in his behavior with one another, listen, and then he, then he, he grew um, immoral in his living. Now, let's look at this in your notes here. He abused his position. He abused his position and didn't fulfill his duties. Now, my friend, you and I all can look and think in our, in our minds, different Christians, different pastors, different uh, people that we know for over the years, listen, that abused, they grew careless. And then they grew reckless. And then, listen, they began to abuse their position, whether it's in the church or in their home or in their community. Listen, my friend, notice with me in verse 50, and the Lord of that servant shall come. Listen, my friend, judgment day is coming. Listen, you may have been done wrong, and many of you have been done wrong. Many of you have had things said to you, done to you, that ought to have never been said or done to you. But listen, my friend, Jesus is coming right now. Listen, right now. And I know in the situation, I'm sure there were other servants said, well, what gives with this guy? What, 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 how's he, where, where's the king? Why isn't the king taking care of this? Doesn't he care about me? Doesn't he care about what's being said? Look at that guy, he's squandering, wasting his position. He's, he's, a, he's an embarrassment to the king in the kingdom. Listen, the king's paying attention. My friend, please understand, just because God does not immediately respond does not mean that he will not respond. 
you mark her down, friend, Jesus keeps very good records. And that fact and that truth right there, that ought to change the way you live. Now, he abused his position, didn't fulfill his responsibilities. Notice with me, it says in verse 50, he shall come. In the day when you look at not for him, in verse 51, and shall cut him asunder and appoint him his portion with the hypocrites. What happened there? He was stripped of his position and privilege and, his, uh, uh, and was accounted with the wicked to his great shame. You ever wonder why the Bible says that it is after the rapture and after the tribulation and after the marriage supper of the Lamb that is after all of that in the book of Revelation that Jesus is going to wipe away all tears in heaven? Because listen, there's going to be a lot of people who are going to get to heaven and be ashamed of how they lived. Be ashamed of what they did and how they, uh, and, and how they acted in the king's service. Now, who is the hypocrites? It's a good trade. The last person, the fourth uh, person we see here there in this parable uh, in verse 51 is the hypocrite. Who are these hypocrites? Now, notice that they're still in the kingdom. They're not outside the kingdom. They're in the kingdom. These are the fakers in the kingdom. The fakers in the kingdom. What is a hypocrite? A hypocrite gives lip service to the king, but they lack three things. The hypocrite, first of all, lacks a genuine love for their Lord. The hypocrite loves themselves. They do not truly love their Lord and their master, the Lord Jesus Christ. Number two, not only do they lack love for the Lord, number two, they lack loyalty to the Lord. They lack loyalty to the Lord. Loyalty, my friend, is a lost commodity in modern-day Christianity, that we are loyal to our Savior. My friend, if you, if you have the opportunity, the time, I encourage you to go uh, get the, the Fox's Book of Martyrs. How many of you have ever uh, leafed through the Fox's Book of Martyrs? If not, uh, go out today. You can uh, look at it online. I'm pretty sure it's probably public domain. It's many hundreds of years old. But the Fox, the, old, the, the edition I have is an old one. It's about this thick. And Mr. Fox, he was a Christian. And Mr. Fox went through and he, he collected all the different names And all the different stories of the many, many Christians from the from the time of the uh, just after the uh, the time of the apostles and the early church fathers, all the way up. Listen, my friend, even until the uh, 1600s and 1700s. And he gathered together many of those stories of men and women. Listen, who went to their death, not willing to deny Jesus. They were loyal to the Savior who bled and died for them. They were willing to give their life. They were literally willing to give their blood in in loyalty to the Savior. The hypocrite has no loyalty but to them own selves. And then number three, the hypocrite not only lacks love for the Lord, the hypocrite lacks a loyalty to the Lord, but number three, they lack integrity. Integrity in their service for the Lord. They look really good on the outside, But the reality is very different on the inside. There's a disconnect between the public persona, what we see in church on Sunday, what we see in church on Sunday night, than the the man or the woman who truly is that person behind closed doors, in their home or in their car or with their family or at their work site or with their uh, co-workers or friends or buddies. Listen, my friend, there's a complete lack of integrity. Integrity means being all together. There's no holes. There's no gaps. And the hypocrites here are those who, uh, they, they look good. They polish up real well. You would say, my, that, that, that brother, that sister must be an upstanding uh, Christian in their home and in their community. But my friend, internally, they have no true love for the Lord. They have no true loyalty to Christ, and they have no integrity. Uh, Listen, they're one way in public, but they're a different way in private. What happens to the hypocrites? Notice with me, it says, and shall cut him asunder, this is that wicked servant, and appoint him his portion with the hypocrites, and there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Listen, my friend, their treachery, the, the hypocrite's treachery will ultimately be revealed at judgment day. There's no fake in Jesus. You can fake the preacher out. You, if you're really good, you may fake the preacher's wife out, but it's a lot harder, all right? <clears throat> you may even fake your mama out, and that's really difficult to do. 
but there's no fool in Jesus. Those are the people of the parable. Now, go back. Uh, now, the second thing. So, those are the people of the parable. Then we look at the plot of the parable. What happens in this story? And I'm going over a lot of it, but let's look here in their notes here. We see in this parable the workings of the kingdom. Do you know that Jesus was giving us instruction here? He said, let me help you to understand what the church looks like from my point of view. What Jesus, ever look at, we always look at things what it looks like from our point of view. Jesus is giving us the church age from his point of view. So he's the king. Would you say amen to that? We are the servants. Would you say amen to that? Now, Jesus has given us a roles and responsibility and he's going away. And he expects us to fulfill those roles and be faithful in those responsibilities. Would you all say amen to that? That's the plot of the parable. Listen, so we see in this parable the workings of the kingdom. This is how it's supposed to work. Jesus goes away, he gives us a job to do, and we do that job till he comes back. The king is leaving for a time, and he has put his servants in charge of certain responsibility. The king's absence is two things. Number one, it's both long. The king's absence is long. And number two, it is indefinite. Meaning Jesus didn't say, hey guys, on September the 22nd of 2022, I'm coming back. He didn't say that. He just said, listen, I'm going away and I will be back. It's going to be a long absence and it's going to be an indefinite absence. He's coming back. Only he, listen, he know, God knows, the Father knows when he's coming back, but he doesn't tell us. Now, there are two types of servants in his kingdom. Number one, there's the faithful servant and the unfaithful servant. That's how Jesus sees his kingdom. Can I ask you tonight, where do you want to be accounted in the accounting of Jesus' servants? The faithful are those who out of their love, and loyalty to the king are busy with doing their duty without supervision, knowing that their Lord will return and they desire his approval, his approval for their service. My friend, listen, can I say your, 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 your wife ought not to make you have to make you to read your Bible. Can, can I say your husband ought not to have to make you to read your Bible? Our, our young people, our children are downstairs, our teenagers over there. Listen, may I say, I, I would, you, you hear me say it often, to teenagers and children, listen, no one, your mom and dad, your pastor ought not to have to make you read your Bible. Now I understand, listen, with young children, you have to train up children in the ways of the Lord. You need to introduce them who the Lord is. You, you need to introduce them to the Word of God. You need to teach them and train them in the right way, in faithfulness and, and in service and in, in love and in loyalty. You have to train up children in that. They have to see it modeled and mentored and taught and, and, and lived out in their life, my friend. But listen, when you become an adult, no one should have to hold you accountable other than your own love for Jesus. Now, blessed are those servants who will be found faithful when he shows up. Can I say, Christian, it's going to be worth it. When the sky splits and the trumpet sounds and Jesus comes back, you do not want to be in some place you do not want to be. You do not, I, I've often said this, you know, I often, I really, this is just me being petty. This is me just being me. I always, always want Jesus to come back on Super Bowl Sunday night when, Pete, when, when, when those of us are in church are still in church. Some, somebody's got a, a nacho, they're about to take a nacho and the trumpet sounds. And Jesus comes back and they're watching the immorality in the halftime show. Just, listen friend, that's not where you want Jesus to find you when he comes back. Now, they will be rewarded with joy, with the joy of their Lord and promoted to great, greater responsibilities. Now I'm not gonna, we're not going to turn there. But we're going to look at this. This develops further. Jesus develops this thought. So we'll get into that in the next one. The unfaithful. The unfaithful are those who presume. Presume to take advantage of their Lord's absence for their own self-interest. The unfaithful are those who presume to take advantage of the Lord's absence for their own self-interest. My friend, listen. The church is not mine, it's Jesus's. The church is not yours, although we all belong to it, 
but it's Jesus's. It belongs to Jesus. It is not ours to reimagine. It is not ours to reinvent. This is His kingdom. Imagine if somebody comes in, you're going on vacation, you give them your home, you give them the keys and say, please feed the animals and water the plants and make sure everything's taken care of. And you come back and they've completely remodeled it in their style. They got rid of your, 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 they got rid of your plants, they got rid of your dog and your cat, and they've completely gutted your house and they've moved in their stuff and they're like, well, we thought it was ours. I say, no, it's not yours, it's mine. My friend, there's going to be a lot of shocked people when Jesus comes back. Now, they will be ashamed and sorrowful at his return. Now, the point of the parable. So number one, we've looked at the people of the parable. and We've seen the different people that are in the kingdom of God. Number two, we've, we've looked at the, the plot of the parable. That the king has come and he's established his kingdom and he's given roles and responsibility. He's gone away, he's coming back, and he expects us to be faithful in his kingdom. Now, what's the point? Let's make an application here. Now, Jesus gives us a picture of the church age from his vantage point. This is Jesus saying, let me describe for you what I see as I go back to heaven. This is what I'm looking at. He is the king and has appointed his servants to serve him. I would, I would underline that, 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 that sentence in your notes there. The king, listen, has appointed his servants to serve him. That's our theme this year in 2022, saved to serve. Can I ask you this? How are you serving God? In what way, in what role, in what capacity are you playing a part in the work of God? Can I just say Christianity is not a spectator sport. Somehow we've professionalized Christianity and we think we're like a football team and we got the squad that's down on the field and, and, and everybody in the stands is cheering them on. Can I say that is not a biblical model of Christianity? Christianity is not a spectator sport where, where the majority just sit in the stands and, and eat and, and enjoy themselves with uh, hot dogs and nachos and soda pop and watch while the professionals do the work. Nowhere in the Bible will you find that, my friend. That is not a biblical model. Christianity is not a spectator sport. It is a kingdom full of those of us who are serving the king. There are no spectators. There are participants. Listen, there are faithful and unfaithful servants. Now, Jesus is the king. He's appointed a servant to serve him. He has left for a period of time, and he is coming again. When he returns, he expects. He expects to find his servants faithfully serving in the place and position, listen, of his choosing. Guess who gets to decide where you and I serve? Jesus does. Can I say, listen, I love you all, and I love West Michigan, but I, I, I would not have uprooted for the third time in my life in ministry to come all the way to Michigan. I, I was born an Ohioan. I planned on dying an Ohioan, okay? Now, I love my newly adopted state. I, I love the way, uh, I love just about everything up here. I don't like the taxes and the high price of gas, but anyway, other than that, all right, I have found much to love. But listen, it's not up to me. I don't get to decide, listen, how long I'm here or, 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 or how long I'll stay or where I'll go. Listen, when I enlisted in the Lord's army, I said, yes, sir. You tell me where to go and we'll go. And when he calls, we go. Now, I am praying that he leaves us here for a long-term assignment, okay? As I've, 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 I've shared with you, the only two times that I want to move again is either to the nursing home or the rapture. Those are the only two times, all right? Now, Jesus will return, but his servants do not know the day or the hour. They do not need to. They, need, well, they know what they need to know. Do you know that? Do you know we don't, we don't need to know when Jesus is coming back? We know what our, our, our responsibility is, and that's all that our responsibility is. He has a plan and a timetable and will return when it is time. All right? That's the kingdom from his vantage point. Now, let's flip this around. Let's look at it from our vantage point. For, uh, from our vantage point of the 2,000 years of, ch of the church age, it seems like Jesus is never going to come back, or at least not anytime soon. Would you agree with me? I mean, it's been 2,000 years. Do you know how many of the scoffers are like, oh, you guys have been saying that for 2,000 years. You keep telling us that Jesus is coming back. He ain't coming back now. He's not coming back anytime soon. That's because we're looking at it from our perspective. 
not his perspective. Now, the longer it goes before Jesus comes back, the more people do one of three things. Either they forget. They forget about Jesus coming back. Or number two, they don't believe that Jesus is coming back. Or number three, they don't care that Jesus is coming back. One of the most shocking things that I've ever seen in my life was a group of folks that were picketing over something. It was in a magazine, I saw this. And a guy was holding up a placard and said, if Jesus comes back, kill him again. I mean, that, that was like a gut shot. I, I couldn't believe that somebody would have the vitriol to say something like that. But listen, my friends, the longer it goes, they either forget, they don't believe, or they just don't care. And my friend, that's not a good thing to do. They assume that it has no impact on their life and living. Can I say, as we look at Christianity today, can I say one of the reasons and state that Christianity is in the way it is, listen, my friend, they either don't, don't, they've forgotten Jesus is coming back, they don't believe he's coming back, or they just don't care that he's coming back. They just assume it has no impact on their life and living. They can live however they want. But the king is coming, and he expects to find us faithful in our position. He appointed it to us. Listen to this. It's important to him. Everything about this? Everything about your role? Jesus gave you that role. And he, it was important to him that he gave you that role. If it's important to him, it ought to be important to us. We do not know when he will return. We should expect him every day. Now, the imminent return of Jesus. What does that mean? It means at any time. That word eminent means that he can return. Listen, before I finish the next sentence, how many guys would be excited about that? Amen. Praise the Lord. The eminent return of Jesus should do one, uh, three things. Number one, it should motivate us to faithful service. The eminent return that Jesus could come back today, it should motivate us to faithful service. Number two, it should encourage us to spiritual diligence. It should encourage us to spiritual diligence. Listen, that my walk with God is important because when Jesus comes back, I want it to be like Methuselah. Uh, I want it to be like Enoch. The Bible says that Enoch walked with God and was not for God took him. Enoch walked so close with God. Listen, it was not a difficult transition when God took him home. I want to be so close to Jesus when he comes back. It's just going to be a sweet reunion. Number three, the imminent return of Jesus should hold us accountable. It should hold us accountable to integrity. The fact that Jesus is going to come back and I'm going to see him face to face and I'm going to look in his eyes and I'm going to see his nail-pierced hands. Listen to me, my friend. It should hold me accountable on everything I do, everything I say, and everywhere I go. My friend, listen, I want Jesus to find me faithful. That's the parable of the faithful servant. Let's pray. Father, we come before you this evening. We thank you, Lord. Jesus, I want to thank you for showing us what it means to be a servant in the kingdom of God. Lord, from your point of view. God, many times we look at it from our point of view and we say, well, I don't have an important job. And, and, and no one really asked me to do this job. I'm just doing it because I, I, it needs to be done. But yet, Lord, in your leading, and God, in your directing, God, you've given us uh, each a responsibility to do. Sometimes it's not glorious, and sometimes it's not uh, notoriable, and, and many times you don't get to recognize for what you're doing. But God, you, you, you gave it to us. And so, Lord, it's important. It was important for you. And so, Lord, it should be important to us. So, Father, I pray and ask, dear Lord, as we search our hearts tonight and we examine our living before you, God, I pray, dear Lord, that there would be, Lord, an earnest desire that each of us would be found faithful when you come again. Lord, help us tonight, we pray in Jesus' name. And amen. We'll stand this evening with heads bowed and eyes closed. As musicians begin to play a verse of invitation softly,